Welcome to the Live Free, Love Life podcast, where we discuss how to create more freedom so we can love our lives no matter what we're going through. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Live Free, Love Life podcast. Today, I have a very special guest for you. Her name is Bonnie, and I'm just going to go ahead and let her introduce herself. So, Bonnie, tell us what you do, who you help, and why you are so passionate about helping. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mindy. So I am a life coach, but predominantly a business coach right now. I was telling Mindy before we started recording that it's so important that we watch our mind when we're doing something new, right? Like starting a business that's scary and overwhelming. We think we need to know the how. And so we learn the how and we start implementing the how. And then we freak out because our brain's like, I don't want to do this or I can't do this or I don't know what's wrong with me or it's not working. Tell me, why are you so passionate about helping women build businesses? Well, it's interesting because for a lot of people, business is kind of this, especially women, it's kind of this unfeeling, cold entity where everybody's just focused on the bottom line. And for me, it's been the exact opposite. It has been a vehicle for mental and emotional and spiritual growth for me. So I'm passionate about showing that to other women because I think a lot of women feel maybe the call, especially as your kids get older, or maybe they're all in school and you're like, okay, what now? Maybe you've been a stay-at-home mom or maybe you want to change a career or something. Showing them the power that comes from being able to build your own business is so mind-blowing. And I know a lot of people have just completely changed their lives by being able to build something creatively that they feel really passionate about. And what I've noticed is women entrepreneurs in particular choose things that they are very, very passionate about. Unlike, I think men sometimes are just like, oh, that sounds like a good way to make money, right? And women are not like that generally. I always looked at people who had businesses and I was like, I'm never doing that. And mostly it was because what I saw was them spending every single second of their entire lives in their business. And they had no time for fun and no time for family. I was like, that one's terrible. I'm never doing that. Yep. And what I have found is exactly what she said. It has been such a, a vehicle for growth. It's amazing how building a business, it is so good at pushing you out of your comfort zone mm. and really just allowing yourself to up-level in ways that I truly never even thought were possible. And on this podcast, we talk a lot about freedom and all the things that are holding us back and keeping us stuck and then the key to freedom so that we can stop being stuck and we can break free from that. So what are the biggest roadblocks or struggles that you see your people deal with the most often? I think one of the biggest ones is the lack of evidence, right? So when we want to become, let's just say moms, right? We think, oh, I'd love to have children. We might not have experience that we can be a good mom, but we see millions of people doing it. And they're like, okay, if someone's, if my neighbor can do it, I can probably do this too, right? And my mom did it. My sister did it. Not a big deal. But how many of us know successful entrepreneurs that, to your point, balance family and work adequately or appropriately, and they're not crazy and they're successful? We don't see that a lot. So that lack of evidence is crippling for people. They think, well, I can make this work until the first try doesn't work or the second try. And then they have this crippling self-doubt, like, I actually don't know that I can do this. And so we think we need that evidence before we can succeed. Well, and I think, too, it, we don't have the people to tell us we're on the right track. Yes. Because we don't have those examples and we fail and we fail and we fail. And we're like, well, maybe I wasn't cut out for this. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I actually can't do this. Because again, we don't have that mom friend who's like, oh, no, that's totally normal. Yeah, right. It's totally you're fine kid. when your yeah. two-year-old does this. It's no yeah. big deal. You're fine. We don't yeah. have those people telling us that we're okay and that we're on the right yeah. track. That's a really good point, actually. And because there are a billion and one ways to build a business, just like there's a billion and one ways to parent, if you don't have that roadmap, it can be very paralyzing. And that's why I love what I do, because I'm here to be like, that's normal. That's normal. Yep, that's going to fail. Yep, totally normal. Just keep going. Keep tweaking. Don't take it personally. That's what business is all about, right? But without that, it is terrifying. And you just would rather give up than feel stupid over and over and over. So if there are women listening that maybe either feel called to build a business or even just to do something else, or if there's women out there who are listening who are in the business and they don't have those people showing them, tell me, how do these struggles typically show up with your people? Paint a picture so that they can see how incredible incredibly normal they really are, that they're not alone. They're not unicorns. This is normal. So paint that picture for us. Yeah. I think the first thing that happens is we take, like I said, we take everything really personally. So let's say I'm a coach and I'm like, hey, I'm giving away some free coaching and nobody responds. I'm like, oh, everybody thinks I'm a terrible coach. That's my first thought. Everybody thinks that I can't do this and nobody wants what I have when really everyone's just busy or the algorithm didn't show your post to anybody, right? Like it's so not personal. And I believe that anyone who feels called to it or feels like this might be something they want to explore can absolutely do it. It's just going to take time. I love to look at a business as a science experiment. 
there is no right or wrong way. You're just going to have to try different things. The people who are attracted to you might resonate with this over this, right? Mindy, the people who follow Mindy might like this versus this. My people might like different things, right? We just keep trying. But if we're not willing to do that, and like I said, we're not willing to look stupid in the process because that's a big part of it. It's just like, well, I tried this thing and it didn't work. Then we're just going to slide back into our hole. It's all about vulnerability and being willing to try something that is like, oh, I guess that didn't work. Moving on and not making it mean something about ourselves. Right. So things not working, normal. Anytime we try something new, it doesn't even have to be building a business. Anytime we're going to go out and do something new, it not working, normal. Yeah. Yeah. And we are aware of that in other areas, right? Let's say we think, oh, I'm going to run a 5K. I've never been a runner, but I want to try to get in shape. And the first time out, we're able to run like for 30 seconds and then we have to walk. How many of us are like, that was crap. Clearly, I'm not a runner. Most of us, if we're motivated enough, we're going to be like, well, I did not run as far as I thought I was going to the first time. Okay, what can I do next time? Maybe I need to bring some fun music. Maybe I need to go with a friend. Maybe I need to just go 40 seconds next time and then maybe a minute next time. We just keep trying until we're better at it. And kids are so good at this, right? Kids tr pick up anything new. Oh, I can play the violin now. Can they try anything? Adults are like, no, I'm not willing to look dumb. I'm not willing to fail. And so we hide back in our little shell, right? But anytime we can get a chance, like I honestly step into chances where I can feel stupid. I know that sounds silly, but I'm like, yeah, I will totally try that thing that I'm underqualified for because I just want to see. I just want to see what happens. And that takes a lot of practice to get you yeah. to that. One of the uh, visual I love to share with my clients who are struggling with this is, you know, when your, your junior high student starts band yeah. and they come home with their new instrument and we are not expecting music, right? We expect to be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to leave the house for a while while they practice. We expect music for a while. Yes. But when we start businesses, we said, oh, we're just going to post and all these people are going to comment and like and we'll have clients. We're expecting music from day one. Mm -hmm. And to your point, we forget. Kids are so good at knowing this. And it's like as adults, we forget that, no, it's not going to be music for a while. It's going to sound totally. terrible. We're going to play some horrible notes. Because we have actually... It's actually it, yeah. yeah, and it can actually be a really enjoyable phase. I think about it as growing a garden. The first three, four weeks of growing a garden, you see nothing. You see dirt. And you could be tempted to be like, this is terrible. It doesn't work. These gardeners are a scam. No, the plants are doing what they need to be doing. But it takes time to build that foundation. And eventually that garden will feed you, but it will take a long time. If you ignore and deny what's going on under the scenes there, you're never going to reap the reward of the delicious plants, right? So you said it can be enjoyable. Mm. Tell us more about that. What's the secret thought for breaking free from all of this drama we create about showing up and failing and it not working and all the things? How can it be enjoyable? Well, I think the first step is just to acknowledge that you're on the right path. We love to see things kind of black and white, especially for women of faith. We're like, well, I don't know if that's the right path for me. What if you just decided it was, no matter what it looked like, that you were going to fail and mess up and it was still going to be the right path? So having that confidence that whatever I choose to do is the right thing and then acknowledging that growth feels uncomfortable. We can acknowledge that when it comes to eating healthier fitness, maybe even parenting our children. This is uncomfortable. We're going to have hard conversations. We acknowledge that that's good. But in business, we never want to feel uncomfortable. We want to just like you say, post and have people pay us money. And that is not how growth works. We're going to post over and over and over and no one's going to say anything. We're going to offer things over and over and over and nobody's going to take us up on that. And just expect it and just expect it. I've gotten to a point where I can effectively detach my own emotions from the results of my business. And that has been huge. It's taken me years. And that's one thing I try to hurry my clients through is like to a point where we're not feeling like we're a failure every time a project fails or an offer doesn't get purchased. So just acknowledging that, oh, look, that was one way I thought might work and it didn't. What are we going to try next? Instead of like, oh, failure. It's not how you did that. How did you detach yourself from that? Honestly, I just kept failing. There are still times where I'm just like, oh, this feels a little icky. But largely, I just kept doing it. So I'll just give you an example. People love to, especially coaches, like they'll come up with an offer, right? I want to sell so many sessions for such and such a price. And usually we just don't have enough people we're talking to yet. The volume of, of our audience isn't big enough. But when people don't say yes, they immediately want to change the offer. Oh, maybe the price is too high. Maybe the price is too low. Maybe it's not enough sessions. Maybe, maybe you just need to offer it to a thousand more people. So that's one thing I've acknowledged is what if I just kept going over and over and over and I allowed the no's to happen? What if I knew that I was going to have to offer this to a thousand people before someone was going to say yes? 
Would I be okay with that? And then I'm able to be like, oh, that was 997. That was 998. I just count up the nose. It becomes a fun exercise. Like, this is normal. It's actually really abnormal to offer something 10 times and have seven people take you up on it. That's really, really rare. So just acknowledge that, oh, these are how many no's I'm going to get. These are how many failures I'm going to have. Check another one off. Make a little chart for yourself if that helps. I love that. I, I've had some of my clients make a j fail jar or, we, or a no jar. So every time they get one, they get to go put a little bead in their jar. And so they get the dopamine hit from the no or from the fail. And then they're excited to go fail again because they're collecting their thousand beads. Right? Yes. And you pat yourself on the back for that. Yes. You reward yourself for trying something no matter how it turned out. Because in the end, we're not always directly responsible for that result. But we are directly responsible for our action that we take. And for those of you out there who are building businesses, this works for anything. Because I've coached women who are dating after divorce. And they're like, I just can't find the right guy. There aren't any good guys out there. And I'm like, well, how, how many guys have you actually been out with? What if we started a jar for all the dates we go on? A loser jar. <laughs> all the frogs. We're trying to find the prince. If it took 100 and then you knew you were going to find your dream guy, are you willing to go on 100 first dates? To get there. And they're like, yeah. Okay, so what if we just start counting those? Bad first date goes in the jar. Bad first date goes in the jar. So you can use this for so many things because this is just part of being human. It's not necessarily only part of building a business. Absolutely. Yeah. I've seen this also work really well with conquering physical cravings, like whether you're getting rid of an addiction or you, you want to eat less sugar or whatever. Just sitting with that discomfort of, oh, I want that. And I'm going to choose not to. That's another thing you could make a jar or a chart for is like, Oh, look at all these times that I just said no to this thing that I, I really want to eliminate from my life. Yes, love it. Okay, so tell me, how does coaching work its magic in helping people to do this? Okay, well, like I said before, everybody thinks they need to know the how, right? And that's the case in any situation. I want to lose weight. I just need to know what to eat. Or I want to be a better parent. Just tell me the list of things I should say and, and do. But that's not how it works. Our brain is constantly scanning, trying to keep us safe. And a business makes us feel uncomfortable and unsafe all the time. We're getting on the internet and putting ourselves out there. There is a lot of discomfort and a lot of nervous system dysregulation. So acknowledging that my brain is going to do what it's supposed to do. I'm not going to get mad at it. It's going to be upset and frustrated and, and try to shut down. And I'm going to just be its best friend and be like, hey, I see what's happening here, right? And I'm also going to be this higher version of myself and acknowledge that we're going to do this scary thing and I'm going to sweat. And it's going to be uncomfortable. And maybe I'll go a treat for myself later to reward myself for doing this thing. But the brain aspect is huge. Every, everybody wants the how, but probably 97% of the time, it's the mindset. I love it. Do you have a specific client in mind who you could just paint the picture for us? Like, this is where she was before she started working with me. Mm -hmm. And here's where she was after. And here's how we use the coaching to do all these things we're talking about. Can you paint that picture for us? Yeah, totally. Everybody has their own struggles, but this is a pretty common scenario. And it's that the, the client knows what she wants to build and she has this beautiful five-year vision. That's what we always go into in, in the beginning, right? What is this going to look like in a few years? I'm going to have some financial freedom. I'm going to be able to help people. I'm going to make a difference in this area. And so she'll start doing the logistics, right? We'll, we'll start creating a website. And then our next step will be to start a social media channel. And we're going to start sharing some videos. And that's very often where the big block comes up first, right? Because you can build a website behind the scenes that nobody ever knows about. But as soon <laughs> as you first go public, with it, especially if you have a lot of stories about what your friends and family are going to say, what the lady down the street is going to say, you're going to be telling those stories all day long. And that is kind of the first block. And so what we do is we do lots of coaching around what that's going to mean. Okay. So you put something on social media and your neighbor's like, this is stupid. Coaching's a scam or whatever it is you're building, right? <laughs> is this an MLM? Are you taking care of those kids? Or are you just working? Whatever people want to say. Yeah. And then we just sit with it and we're like, oh, interesting that she doesn't like me for whatever reason, or she doesn't like what I'm doing, or, or nobody responded to this post. That's probably even more common than somebody saying something mean, right? There was no response. And then we just sit with that. Am I able to sit with the discomfort that nobody saw this post and keep going? Am I able to acknowledge that some of the things I do as a business owner is going to make other people unhappy? Is it still worth going? So what is the number one thing that people get wrong about all these struggles that we're talking about? I would say they love to come to a business with predetermined identity. And one of those is almost always, I'm not tech savvy. Every one of us is like, oh, I'm really mad at tech. That's not a fact. There is no test for tech savvy that you can pass or fail. It, there's just not. Yeah. And so telling yourself that story, embracing the identity of being not tech savvy, 
will not serve you as a business owner. Frankly, it won't serve you as a human being because we're surrounded by technology all the time. <laughs> Top. That's something you really want to hold on to. Maybe ask yourself, is it worth it that I'm going to keep running into these obstacles? That's a big one. Another one is I'm not a business person. So people come to this with these identities. They're like, oh, I felt really called to opening this shop or, you know, uh, becoming a coach or whatever else. And yet I have these identities that I'm holding on so tightly to. I'm not a business person. I'm like, well, you don't have to be a business person. But if you keep telling yourself that, you're likely going to sabotage yourself because your brain's like, well, I'm not a business person. So I clearly can't do that thing. And it's not conscious. It's also subconscious, right? Mm -hmm. But can we shift our identity a little bit? I wasn't a business person either. Sometimes I'm still like, no, am I a business person? Am I? <laughs> just don't tell myself that all the time. Because what your brain is doing is it's just keeping you safe. If you say I'm not tech savvy and I'm not a business person over and over, your brain's like, can't do business things. Sorry. The other ones I've heard are I'm, I'm not good at sales or I'm not a salesperson. I'm not good at marketing. Nobody wants to be good at sales because they right. all think they're a used car salesman. No. And so I had that one forever. And a coach, an awesome coach, who was like, wait, you sell people on your ideas all the time. Just in my normal life. Even before I was a coach, I'm super passionate about my opinions. This people all the time. I was like, oh. Actually, that's yeah. true. We have to get good at Yeah. But oh, it is dropping all the drama about what that means to be good at sales. Sometimes I let make my clients call it something else. Like you might not be passionate about sales, but you are passionate about helping people change their lives. And you take that passion to a sales call and you tell them, let me show you how I can change your life. And then they're like, take my money. That's how it works, right? We don't have to be spammy and salesy. Right. And we have to drop all that drama. Like you say about the identities, the drama that goes behind all the identities. Yeah. Yeah. And what they mean about who we are and all that stuff. And sometimes we don't acknowledge that the identities we're holding on to so tightly that are keeping us safe are actually blocking us from our best versions of ourselves. I think that God is like, I want you to change. I want you to be better. I want you to grow and expand. And we're like, but I'm not tech savvy. So if we could just release it a little bit, it doesn't mean we have to become a coder or do something scary on the internet. We just have to be willing to learn a little bit and shift just a little bit. So how do you help them spot these roadblocks? They're sneaky, right? They don't even notice it. They don't see it's there. They don't see it's in their way. Mm -hmm. How do you help your clients see it and then also either let go of it or transform it into something different? Yeah. So this is a big thing that happens on almost every coaching call. I'll say, okay, the goal was we'll talk about what they want to work on for the next week. And then we get to a call and they're like, oh, I didn't get it done. And I was like, oh, interesting. So we just talk about what's coming up for them. And it'll be something like, well, I wanted to spend time with my family. Oh, that's an amazing excuse, right? I want to be a family person. That's so pretty. It sounds so pretty. I want to neglect my kids or my grandkids. Or any number of these things. And so our brain is giving us really great, pretty excuses that are in keeping with our values. I'm a family person in order to push off this other thing. So we, we acknowledge that. We find those thoughts. And then I just require action. And I'm like, you're going to feel like you're not a family person for a minute. And it's OK. I want you to go do it anyway. And what that action does is it helps us break free from those limiting stories. The best and quickest way to believe that you are not bad at tech is to conquer some tech. Like, just open up an app and figure it out. The quickest way to get out of, I, I can't make money, is just go make some money. It doesn't matter how. And all of a sudden, your brain is like, oh, there's some evidence. And we're able to break free a little bit. So I love that action piece. I call that uh, creating evidence for my brain. Yes. Technically, my brain is not ready to believe something yet. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, let me prove it to you. And then go do something. And create some evidence. My brain's like, huh. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe. Yeah. Then I go create more of this. My brain gets a little closer to believing what I want to believe. Totally. I love that you pointed out that sometimes it's the identities bumping up against each other. That's the problem. Like if I am a business person, that means I'm not a family person. But sometimes it's questioning the link that we've put there. Like that's not true. Right. If you can be a business person, a very successful business person, and an amazing mom and wife and grandma and whatever it is you want to be. You yeah. can be both. I think sometimes it's questioning the links that we put between the identities. Yeah, I love that. And sometimes we have to go outside of our own little circle to find evidence that somebody else has done that, right? So I, I really like to kind of gather people who are good examples to me of those things. Oh, look, she's able to be both wealthy and humble. She's able to be both a businesswoman and an attentive mom. And I can gather evidence to believe in myself. But with the creating evidence, I think that's so huge. When I first started my coaching business, my brain, of course, was like, I can't make money coaching because I'd never done it before, which is hilarious because I'd actually done some coaching some years before and had made money at it, but I <laughs> forgot about that. 
And so I took a contract coaching position in somebody else's business. And I was talking to a coach friend and I said, yeah, my brain is just holding onto this. And she's like, what about the contract coaching? I was like, well, that doesn't count. This is the other client. It was just so interesting. My brain was holding on so tight, ignored the past evidence of the previous clients, ignored the contract coaching, only wanted it to look a certain way. And what's interesting is it wasn't until I would let go of that that I got clients of my own. Like my well, brain just course. would not let that happen. Because here's the thing with our brains. They like to be right more than they like to be happy. Well, if what we believe is I can't make money as a coach, your brain is going to go to bat to make sure that's true. Because yeah. it cares about being right. So any beliefs that we hold on to and we're just like holding on tight, your brain is going to make sure that that is what happens. Mm. Because it wants to be right because that's safe. It doesn't actually care about with being happy. Which is really interesting. interesting. Yeah. And also, happiness and success requires a large amount of vulnerability. You ever been in a relationship before? How vulnerable do you have to be to gain more happiness? You have to be more and more vulnerable. And the same thing happens with business or passion projects or anything else, a career. As we're able to open ourselves up more to it, more potential for success and growth and happiness occurs. But we have to be willing to look that failure right in the face, look that disappointment right in the face. And that's scary. Totally. And this comes back to how business is such a good vehicle for growth because we have to do it over and over and over and over. And it really helps us to shed the layers that we put on ourselves as we've grown up and tried to be safe. Like it helps us shed those and be more of who we really are. Yeah, totally. What I've noticed too, and this is one reason I'm really passionate about business is I've noticed this movement of women, especially those who have been stay-at-home moms for many years, of getting on the internet and doing something businessy or the influencer movement or YouTube or whatever it may be. And I think it is this really cool way of seeing amazing people that would have otherwise been kind of hidden, right? Most of us are, would just go about our daily lives, taking care of our kids and our families and maybe going to work. But way, as soon as we put ourselves on the internet, other people can see what we're doing and see us be good moms and good neighbors and good Christians, whatever we are, and want to follow. And so I think that business is a way for us to not only help our families financially and because we're better people, but to also help the world in general, just as examples of somebody who's working hard to balance both things, to grow, to improve, to fix my brain, all the things that I am struggling with that you're struggling with. It's a really cool thing to watch. I agree. I've always worked for financial reasons. So I was always a working mom. But I just worked in corporate. I always had a job that I was good at, but didn't really enjoy or love. It gave me no fulfillment. And it hadn't even occurred to me that I could do something I loved and make money and make way more money. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even in my paradigm at all. And it took somebody else's example, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Someone else doing that for my brain to be like, wait, you can do that. <laughs> It wasn't that I doubted myself. It's that truly the idea never even entered my mind. Yeah. So I love what you're saying, that we can go out and be examples to other women mm -hmm. to help them go after their dreams and live their best lives because maybe it has never even occurred to them that they could. Yeah. And what is so cool is the day and age that we live in right now, I'm sure we're all appreciative of our cars and our washing machines and our cell phones and the cool technology we have. But do we realize what it means for our freedom and for our capacity to be there for our families and still make an impact on the world and still make money from our houses? No one ever in the history of the world has been able to do that. Do we really understand just how mind-blowing and cool this is? And if it's even remotely something interesting to you, chase it. Create your dream, your vision, and then just go try something. Why not? What's the worst thing that could happen? I a thousand percent agree with that. Lately, I've been thinking, oh, man, I am so grateful that I put myself in the position I'm in where I'm building my own business because my kids have needed me so much lately. I feel like I'm taking them here and doing this and all the things. I could not have done that working my corporate job that I was in mm -hmm. before coming to coach. It would have been impossible. My boss gave me crap every time I needed to go do something for my kids. It wasn't fun. And I was like, wow, this is so amazing. I can take my kid here. I can be here to support them this way. It's awesome. It yeah. is the best thing ever. Having your own business creates more freedom than I even ever thought was possible. Yeah. Yeah. You think you need a lot of time and energy for toddlers, but have you had teenagers? Because they also <laughs> require immense amounts of emotional strength. <laughs> it's not just the things. It's the supporting them through that. Teenagers are hard. Yeah. And if you aren't filling your own cup, which oftentimes means doing something you love, 
if you're going to that job that you hate and you feel burnt out all the time, it is super hard to be there when they really need you because you're so empty. Yeah. You don't have enough left to give over. I think it's so important for us as moms to be doing the things that light us up because it puts us in a position to be there for our families at totally higher levels. I'm super glad you brought that up because that was like my rallying cry for the first 10 years of being in business. I had little kids and it was almost impossible to do things sometimes, but it was for me. It was strictly for me. Even when I was only making just a little bit of money on the side, I would be changing diapers all day long. Then I was like, go to bed now because mom has to go do her blog because if not, I'm going to lose my ever-loving mind. And that was a really awesome lesson for me. If my cup is full, not full, I am a terrible parent. I'm <laughs> really <laughs> terrible. And I, my cup was getting full by doing creative things by being an influence on somebody else, by showing others how they could also balance family in something of their own. I think that's really critical. We think that by giving everything, we're a better mom, but in the end, it just burns us out. We end up terrible. Yeah, this is actually a lesson I learned. I learned it a lot of ways. I was struggling with Lyme disease for many years, and I'm finally just now getting over it, like in the past few months. And coaching, actually, I think is what saved me from Lyme disease because it was giving in a way that I felt so fulfilled because I was helping someone else to make their life better. That fulfillment is what got me through Lyme disease. So even though I felt terrible, and even though if I did have energy, my brain is like, you should give this to your family. I had to go do that thing that really lit me up inside so that I could keep going, so that I could be there for them in other ways. And in the end, I, I, I don't want to minimize anyone's struggles Because being a mom is very full. You could spend all day just doing mom things, ferrying kids here and there and cleaning the house or whatever. But I have actively gotten to a point where I'm actually relinquishing things that don't require me or don't have to be done every day, like changing sheets or whatever the things that we fill our days with, so that I can have time for my family and for my business. And some things fall through the middle. Now that I have older kids, they do help out more. But there are many years where I'm like, my house just looks like a disaster. And it's worth it for me so that I can have the thing that fills me up psychologically and still be available for my kids. Cleaning the house was not one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> and for so me I, did, I did my bare minimums. Mine did not fall through the middle. I actually made a not to do list and started putting things like on it so that every time my brain had drama about it, like when I walk up to my house and I see all the weeds and my brain's like, oh my gosh, you should take care of those. All the neighbors were judging you. Brain, remember how we decided on purpose not to do that? It's on our not to do list because mm-hmm. right now it's not nearly as important as these other things I've decided to do. And I started that when I was building a business. I couldn't give my all to my business and to my family and to all of these other little things. So I just put them on my not to-do list. I love that. And it is a constant exercise and reminding yourself of that. I feel like I'm pretty good at it now, but it still flares up. Like if I go to a friend's house, it's like really neat and put together. Mm -hmm. My brain starts attacking me like, oh, well, your house is disgusting. What's wrong with you? Oh, no, no. Remember? Yeah. Like you say, no, 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 brain, remember. It's just so helpful because we know our brains are going to do that. Our our brains are never going to stop talking about certain things. Yeah. So it's making that intentional choice so you have something to say back rather than being like, I know you're right. It's terrible. Yes. Yes. Don't let your brain bully you when you've already made the decision. (laughs) So tell me, how has your journey of breaking free from your struggles shaped the way you help others break free? Oh, that's a good question. So... I actually was blessed as a kid to move around a lot. And that doesn't sound, it's not a blessing when you're 13. But what I learned was that every time we moved someplace new, I could reinvent myself. And so I tried lots of things that I wouldn't have tried if I had stayed at the same school, right? I went to a new middle school and I was like, maybe I want to play soccer here. Hey, nobody knows I'm not a soccer player. And maybe I want to be a cheerleader here. Let's try cheerleading. And sometimes, more often than not, I failed miserably. I was not a soccer player, turns out. But what was so cool is that I just let myself do it. And so my experiences of trying things and being like, that wasn't the thing, allowed me to just take some of that pressure off and to acknowledge that things that I try and don't quote unquote succeed at doesn't define me. It actually says a lot of cool things about me. I think that I'm willing to try something new. And so that's what I'm trying to show my clients is that whatever you do just makes you a better person, just makes you more well-rounded. We really love to pigeonhole ourselves and be like, well, I am a X, I am a Y, like this is all I am. But what if you could be anything you wanted? What if you could be a little of this and a little of this and a little of this and a little of this? Wouldn't that be fun? And to give yourself permission to stretch and grow. And you can start in really low pressure scenarios, right? Let's say you've never been creative. You never considered yourself creative. What if you just tried to paint something this weekend? 
what would that mean about you? And what if it was terrible? And you were like, awesome. I just painted a terrible picture that nobody would ever want to hang up. Just that freedom to try something and be terrible at it is so freeing. And it, you might end up loving it and decide to get better at it, or you might not. And it, neither is a waste. Both ways allow you to step into that discomfort of something new. Awesome. And like you said, kids are so good at this. We as adults, we forget somehow. But with action comes clarity. So for those of you out there who really don't know what you want to do, maybe you know you're not as fulfilled as you want to be, or you don't have as much joy as you want to have, but you're not really sure how to get to that higher level. If you trust something and you find out you're not a soccer player, for example, you're like, cool, that gets me still closer to knowing what I do want. Crossing things off the list still helps you to learn and to grow, even if it wasn't the thing. Yeah, and you might actually learn some lessons that pushes you closer towards something you are good at. Maybe you're like, I actually hate the running part, but I really like the competition. Maybe there's a different sport I could do. So as an example, my first real business online was a blog and an e-commerce shop. And it has nothing to do with coaching. It was DIY and sewing. And I loved it. And when it came time to transition into coaching, it was terrifying because I was like, this is nothing like what I've been doing. And what if I'm terrible at it? And it was all okay. I learned so much through that business that helps me coach my clients now, even though they're vastly different industries. So you just never know. Taking action is 1,000 times more useful than sitting around twiddling your thumbs going, gee, I wish I could figure out what I'm good at. Yeah, I wish I could figure out what I enjoy. You have to just start something. I don't know what my purpose is. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go try something. Yeah. Action brings clarity. Totally. I love that line. Do you have any go-to tips or exercises that you could share today that would help people kick off this freedom journey of really stepping into this? I would love to go back to my five-year vision here because this is one of the first activities that we do with my clients. And What it does is it puts you back into that kind of childlike imagination state where anything is possible. So you just sit down and you write about your life five years from now, but there are no limitations. Even if you have little kids still, or even if you're divorced and you want to dream about marriage or something that's not a reality right now, do that. Dream about that amazing vision and just write it in as much detail as possible. Picture your house, picture your car, picture your family, picture what you do every day. Picture the color on your walls, as much detail as possible. And no holds barred. Like you want to be, I don't know, an athlete or something and you're overweight and can't even run around the block, put that down. It doesn't matter because it's an exercise in wanting. And I think this is really crucial for us that we don't do a lot as women. We're like, well, I'm just satisfied where I am. But wanting is, I think, a really healthy and even godly pursuit to want to become better and to want new and more things and to expand and to grow. Be honest with yourself. What do you want? Do you want a really nice car? Okay, write it down. There's no shame in that. Do you want your kids to not need you and move out? Okay, put that down. Just get really, really honest with yourself. That is such a great start because then you can look at it and go, what can I do to take myself one step closer? And what are the emotions that I'm looking for there? That's another big one. I want the new car because I think it's gonna make me feel like I belong in my group of friends or I think it's gonna make me feel successful or whatever. And then we can start moving towards those emotions now, even before the car comes or even before the kids move out. But that wanting exercise is so powerful and really enjoyable. And it helps me just realize that literally anything is possible, really. I might get to a point where I'm like, actually, the athlete thing, no, I'm good. (laughs) But I do really want to work towards the car or whatever it may be. I think I like to think of our desire like our GPS. That true desire, the ones in your heart. I'm not saying that means it's serious or meaningful. Wanting a certain car, awesome. If you really want that, that is your GPS to your best life. And if you have that desire, it means you can have it. I'm five feet tall. I'm never going to be a pro basketball player. I also don't want to be. I have no desire for that. I'm not saying you can do and have anything in the whole world. I really am never going to be a pro basketball player. But I don't have that desire. It's your desires that show you your path. And if you desire it, that means it's possible. So why wouldn't you go for it? And if you're making this list and you start noticing thoughts from your brain, oh, I can't want that. I can't have that. This is when a coach can be super, super helpful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these thoughts are so ingrained in our brains. We literally can't let go of them on our own. We need help. And that's okay. Just like I can't just go heal my broken arm by myself. 
And I don't have drama about that, that I need help. I have to go to the expert and they're going to fix my arm. There are lots of things happening in our brains that literally we need help, just like to fix your broken bone. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's totally normal. And it's worth getting the help. Yeah. One coaching session can completely change the entire trajectory of your life because you're able to let go of the things that are just holding you right here. And if you don't get rid of them, they could hold you here forever. Yeah, I like to call it exploding our paradigms because depending on where we were raised and with whom and by whom and what community we lived in, we have certain boxes that we've put around ourselves. This is how I should behave. This is how my family should behave. And there's nothing wrong with them. It's just, it's not truth. It's just our own paradigm that we've created because it makes us feel comfortable based on what we've seen. To be able to look at them and be like, I don't know that I want to keep believing that I can't have a successful career and be available for my family. Boom. I'm going to explode that one, right? Just because I've never seen it done doesn't mean it's not possible. And that's what a coach can do for you is like, did you realize that you have this box around this and you're limiting yourself? And we're like, no, nope, I didn't realize that. that that's like the, some of the fun of coaching session as a client or a coach when you're like, wait, what is yes. she So how important is self-awareness in this whole process of breaking free? And how do you help your clients build that muscle? Oh, it is so critical and goes back to those stories and those identities that we talked about before, right? When we are not aware of ourselves, we think that everything that our brain offers us is truth, right? I'm sure you talk to your clients about that a lot, right? This story comes up and it's like, well, that's true. Evidence, 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 evidence. And we're like, oh, actually, your brain created the story and then found the evidence, right? It's actually backwards than what we think. And when we think about faith, like in a religious context, we know that faith is believing in something we can't see. But it's so hard for us to apply that in other areas. Like business is a big one. What if we just believed it was possible even without the evidence? And as we can shift into that, our brains find the evidence. So now instead of looking for evidence that my business fails, I look for evidence that it succeeds everywhere. Anytime I see a successful woman working from home with kids, I go, she did it. But it was a long road. It didn't happen overnight. At first, it was like, oh, let's find all the evidence. I'm going to fail. Even if you're not working with a coach regularly to be doing self-coaching, like just to be writing down the thoughts that are coming up around things, especially when there's a block, especially when I just can't seem to something, make myself work out, make myself work on my business, make myself get up early, make myself stop yelling. Whatever that is, do a brain dump, right? Get all your thoughts out on paper and look at them and you're going to be shocked at what's in there. So that is like getting that third party perspective is like, oh, I don't want that in there. <laughs> Writing it down was super important because if you try to do the work in your head, you're still up in the mess, right? Yeah. Like trying to clean something from within the mess. Yeah. You got to take it out so you can look at it and really see what's in there. And I love uh, talking to my clients about parts work, right? The, the different parts of your brain. You have like mm -hmm. the sad part and the happy part and the goal oriented, whatever. And I think when you put it out on paper, it allows that that authentic self to be like, oh, error, error, error. She's in charge again, right? Instead of those little parts. No, I'm holding on to this one. You can't let it. You can't take it from me. It's so boring. Yeah. And here's, uh, I will tell you what will come up when you start looking for that other evidence that you can be successful is your brain will immediately start to deny it because it knows what that means. What that means is it's going to have to get to work. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have to do with some unsafe stuff. So every time my friends are like, oh, but I can't do this thing. And I was like, why do you think your brain's telling you can't? So I don't have to. Yeah, it's like, please. I'm loathing brought that up. <laughs> All right. So besides coaching, are there any other cool resources or tools that you have found super helpful for working with people as they break free? I would probably say... Being at peace with, this is going to sound weird, but being at peace with who you are right now. So when we get into coaching, we like immediately want to fix everything, right? That's the first thing that happens is everybody sees their thoughts and their thought errors and they're like blaming themselves and judging themselves for it. To just sit into where I am right now is so powerful. Like right now I have some awesome tools and I've come a long way and I'm a hot mess. And there are days when I scream at my kids, maybe most days. To accept that is so freeing because you don't have to fight anything. You are exactly where you're supposed to be right now. And some of you is amazing and some of you is terrible, right? Like welcome to humanity. I grew up as a perfectionist, as many of us do, right? Mm. I would just bury any evidence that I wasn't perfect because that was terrifying to look at. And now I'm like, let it come. I don't have to hide. I'm like, yeah, I really suck at that. Sorry. Yeah. So Bonnie, this has been so fun to have you on the show. Do you have anything that you would like to give our listeners if they want to uh, work with you or if they want to use one of your exercises or whatever? 
Sure. Yeah. I have a great download and like a little mini presentation I can give your listeners. It's called Finding Your Zone of Genius. And basically what it does is it will take you, especially if you're in a phase where you're thinking like there might be something more for me, whether it's a business or a hobby or whatever, you can do this little download and figure out what you're really good at, what you're really passionate about, what you could offer the world in some capacity or another. And it doesn't have to be a way to make money. It could just be a charity initiative that you're really thinking about, or it could just be something you do on the weekends to make you feel really fulfilled. So I'm happy to share that with them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. So that will be down in the show notes, along with all of Bonnie's information, her website, her socials, whatever you need so that you can find her. We are so grateful you were on the show today to help us to start breaking free from where the shackles that are holding us back. Thank you for watching this episode of Live Free, Love Life. Please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to like, comment, and share. See you next time.